Are we on now? Okay. Um, just so you look forward to the message, <clears throat> I thought I needed to share with you some Christmas information. What does Santa suffer from if he gets stuck in the chimney? Claustrophobia. What did Santa say to Mrs. Claus when he stepped into a big puddle? It must have been the reindeer. <laughs> what is it called when a snowman has a temper tantrum? Meltdown, right. <clears throat> what do grapes sing at Christmas? Tis the season to be jelly. <laughs> what do you call a broke Santa Claus? St. Nicholas. What did Santa Claus, excuse me, why did Santa Claus get a parking ticket on Christmas Eve? He left his sleigh in a no snow zone. No snow, in a snow parking zone. Uh, what do you call cutting down a Christmas tree? Christmas chopping. And what kind of motorcycle does Santa ride? A Holly Davidson. And what is the little snowman's favorite day in kindergarten? Snow and tell. And what did the English teacher call Santa's little helpers? Subordinate clauses. And what did the gingerbread say after all the cookies were eaten? This gingerbread man, that is. What did he say after all the cookies were eaten? It is so hard to bake new friends. <clears throat> now, I know, now aren't you ready to go for this sermon? <laughs> two weeks, my friends, two, uh, not two weeks, three weeks, three, three Thank you. Three weeks until Christmas, and it's the time that we celebrate that night of nights when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I know what a busy time it is, especially if you are young and have children at home. Honestly, I do remember, and uh, my thoughts are with you. Um, this week, I just sat down and jotted these words out about the meaning of of Christmas. God the Father wanted to reveal himself to us. So he sent his son to become one of us. So God the Son could give his life for us. So God the Holy Spirit could come and live his life in us so Jesus could live his life through us reaching out and drawing others to his heart that my friends is what Christmas is truly about you see the Prince of Peace was born to die that we might live on and on and on. And in that living, he gave us the opportunity to live in perfect intimacy with God and eventually with all of those who love him. You see, on that night of night, God came looking. He came looking for you and for me. He was looking for us. And why was that? Was God lonely? Some people think so. I absolutely do not. God had perfect communion and fellowship within the Godhead. And he had all he needed. There's, God is not a needy person in any way. He just wanted to be with us. With us. That's why he came. And we read over there in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. And Matthew quotes from 
from Isaiah in chapter 7, 14, and he said this, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, and in Hebrew that's translated, God is with us. God is with us. He came to be with us. The infinite holy God is seeking something. And what he is seeking and what he desires is oneness, oneness with frail, finite us. That's what he's looking for. It's all about relationship. And I think one of the top ten miracles of all time and eternity is the fact that this infinite, amazing God of ours can focus upon each one of us personally and individually all at the same time. But yet he knows and we know that all of his love and attention, it's just like it's focused on us. Think of it. Eight billion souls in this world. And God can love and communicate his affection and treasure to each one of us. You know, to understand the miracle of our oneness with the Father, we must begin with the oneness that Jesus enjoyed with his Father. And I just want to say this morning, I got a ton of scriptures, and don't try to write them down. Those of you, some of you do, a handful. But I, I left, a, there are some handouts over there that you can pick up, and every scripture reference in this message is there, and also the points, so just relax. And, and just listen. You know, the Bible says, do not, he says in 2 Timothy, do not neglect the public reading of scriptures. And so this morning, I'm just going to read some scriptures and basically let them do the talking. Um, God talks through his word, in case you didn't notice that. <laughs> and, uh, and probably better than most of us uh, secondhand, it's in between guys, you know, when we get up here. But I'll make some few comments of the scripture as we go through here. But I want you to listen to the testimony of Jesus concerning the oneness that he had with his father. In the ten, in the, first of all, we're going to go to the Gospel of John. In chapter 10, verse 30, he said it, couldn't have said it plain, more plainly. He said, I and my father are one. We are one. In 1410, the night before he died, Jesus said, Don't you believe that I am in my Father and that the Father is in me? And in verse 20, he said, I am in my Father. And now he's speaking to his friends. I am in my Father and you are in me. And I am in you. In you. What a, have you ever pondered the miracle that the God who spoke the universe into existence can take up residence in these clay bodies because he wants to be with us as closely as he can be. In verse 23, Jesus said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. God wants to be with us. And then Jesus said in verse, <clears throat> excuse me, not yet. <laughs> this is what he said. He, I don't know. Oh, this is for, this is verse, I know, I lost my place. This is between 7 and 10 in John 14. Jesus said this, If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. Yeah. Jesus came to reveal his Father. Then he went on to say, From now on, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Boy, that was confusing to some of them. They were scratching their head, and Philip piped up, and he said, Well, Lord, show us the Father. Just show us the Father, and that will be enough from us. 
and listen to the words of Jesus as he replied. Here's what I really believe about this verse. I believe the Father was actually speaking right through the vocal cords of the Son. Listen to what he said. Jesus answered, uh, you know, Philip had just said, show us the Father and that'll be enough. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, after I have been with you so long? And then he went on to say, Jesus did, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? See the union there? The words I say to you, Jesus said, the words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. He is speaking through me. And so Jesus did, said then, he said, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. And so Jesus enjoyed actual oneness with his Father. But he goes on to say that this oneness that he has with his Father, that is something for every one of us as well. That's why he came, to be with us. In the fourth chapter of John, excuse me, the fourth verse of John 15, Jesus said this, depends on your translation. He said, abide or remain, abide in me, and I also will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide or remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide or remain in me. I am in the vine, you are the branches. Excuse me, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I think he meant nothing of eternal value. I mean, I can tie my shoes and start the car maybe without him. But anything of value. And so I have this little picture. Uh, if, uh, <clears throat> and it's a beautiful little illustration of the vine and the branches. You know, Jesus is the vine, and I am the branch. In fact, you might say I'm a branch manager. You, know, you, you, just, you just might say that because the life of Jesus, though to, my, to my, the degree of my surrender and openness, openness, the life of Jesus flow, flows through me and produces fruit, fruit that will last. Now, um, you have to do one thing, though, here now. You have to maintain your connection with the vine. It is so critical. Notice that the vine is intricately and intimately <laughs> bonded to the, excuse me, the branch is intimately bonded to the vine. I mean, there's, I mean because with that, there's, without that, there is no flow of life. And so the Christian life is really the branch life. It's a branch life is what it is. How would you, you know, I, I said I need to write a definition of what it means to abide in Jesus. You know, I've heard this for, you know, I've studied this for so long, but I said to myself, I've never written a definition, so I, here's, here's mine. Abiding in Christ means this, living aware, both the conscious and the felt realization, living aware of his presence and his oneness with us. 
You know, it's so easy to just go through the day, really, and forget about the miracle. We are one with Christ. That's part of what he purchased in his death, our oneness with him. Now, how and when did that bonding happen, that oneness? Where did it take place? Well, we read over in John chapter 3, you all know the story, one night, uh, or one night Nicodemus came to Jesus with some questions. He was a teacher of the law. He didn't want to be seen out in public, really, in the daytime, knocking shoulders with the one that, you know, the rest of them are trying to get rid of, you see. And so Nicodemus comes at night. And he asks this question, or <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus, verse starting in verse 3. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Nicodemus, born again? How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus said, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water first, that's physical birth, and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So what does it mean to be born of the Spirit? How does that new birth happen, that second birth? It happens when by faith a person repents and surrenders his life and all that's in the future to God and puts their faith, hope, and trust in the blood of of Jesus Christ plus nothing else to save them. A miracle happens at that moment. And what that miracle is, we read about in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. It says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed, his seed remains in them. They can't go on sinning because why? They have been born of God because his seed remains in them. Now, the Greek word for seed is sperma. That's interesting, isn't it? And so the seed of God is the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit comes when we receive Christ and we say that prayer. The miracle is, is that seed rushes in to our invisible human spirit and impregnates that spirit with God's life. And there's immediately a new creation. That's what happens. You can't see it. You can't feel it. Does a couple know when there's a new baby instantly? You can't feel it. But you can see the results. It isn't too long before a pregnant lady begins to show, right? Right? And so does a person who's truly been born again. His lifestyle begins to change. Sometimes it's immediate, sometimes it's slow, but there is change that happens when there's been conception. It really is. <clears throat> By the way, the word for spirit in the original language of the Bible in the New Testament is pneuma or pneuma. It's where we get the word pneumatic, like pneumatic tires, pneumonia, all of those words come from the same word that's translated spirit. And it means breath. It means wind. And it's translated spirit. In the Old Testament, it's the word ruach. In Hebrew, I always like it because it's, I mean, I I mean, it's hard to I like the word, but it's hard, it's hard to say because you end up clearing your throat trying to say it. But, but ruach means breath also. It means breath. It's the word that was used by Moses in Genesis when he's, when he's writing the Pentateuch in, in chapter 1. Uh, chapter, anyway, um, like, is it one, chapter 1 or 3? Both, maybe 1. Anyway, God says, or Moses said, God breathed 
ruach into into the nostrils of Adam, the breath of life. And so that's where new birth happens. It comes through the coming of the seed of God, which is the Holy Spirit into us, and there's new life. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says the glory, we need to know that the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. And in Colossians 3 verses 3 to 4 we read, For you died, and your life is now hidden with God, with, excuse me, hidden with Christ in God. When you think about that, if our life is hidden with Christ in God, I think that's a pretty secure place for us to be. In fact, I, I, I can't imagine anything more secure than being in that position with Christ in God. And we learn from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 130 that it was because of him that you are, speaking of the Lord, the, the God the Father, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Those two words, that phrase, in Christ, in Christ, that appears in Paul's writings 93 times. That means it's important. Every time you read, and when you read in, your, in the New Testament, you come across those two words together, in Christ, just stop and think about what it's talking about. That is extremely critical. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means what's true of him is true of us. The union happened in the new birth, and, 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 and the, the apostle Paul in Romans 6 says that, don't you know that all of you who have been baptized into Christ have what? Been united to it? They've been baptized into his death. We were baptized into his death so that in like manner as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we are united with him in death, and as he was raised together, as he was, we were raised with him together through the glory of the Father, that we too should walk in newness of life. And so there's the unity there, and, and that's the dying part. Probably this is the most significant verse that I'll read all morning. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Paul said this. He's speaking of physical marriage first. He says, the two will become one flesh. That's in verse 16. And listen to verse 17. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Did you catch that? All of us have a oneness with the Lord if we have been born again truly from above. You know, the oneness oneness of marriage is a great metaphor for the spiritual oneness that we have. In Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, we read, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is, and then Paul, he, he, uh, he, goes, he says, in case you didn't get that, I'll just explain it. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. He said this oneness of marriage between a a husband and a wife, this one flesh relationship, is an illustration of the one spirit relationship that we have in the church as members of Christ himself. You know, friends, marriage should have both a leaving and a cleaving. Uh, A lot of troubles in marriages happen when there's a leaving, from parents or situation, but there isn't a healthy cleaving that happens between a couple afterwards. I, I've just seen it 
many times and in, in different ways. It's so easy to live together as husband and wife in the same house for three, five, ten, and maybe sadly sometimes even 20 or 30 years. But there's not a real intimacy in spirit, in, in person, in um, thought between the couple. You can live under the same roof with the same person and be married and not have intimacy. You really can. It's the same with our Jesus. He can come. You can give your heart to Christ. He can come and live inside of us day in and day out. But you can you may not really deeply have any intimacy with him. And that's why he came. He came with us not just to live inside this temple, in this flesh temple. He came not just to live inside it. He wanted to be with us and he wanted to share everything. And he wanted to communicate. He wants intimacy with us. And it takes a little bit of time to foster intimacy. You have to be intentional in a husband and wife relationship. You have to choose and you have to make time. Everybody has time, but you have to make time. You have to, you have to cordon it off so you can be together and can share and talk and grow together. And the same thing is true about this oneness. The, Jesus is here. He's part of us, but he needs us to focus on him and to focus on time with him to develop intimacy and closeness. And what is the purpose? What is the purpose of love and physical oneness in marriage? Well, a lot of them, but one is bearing children most of the time, okay? That was God's design in marriage that we might bear children. And we read these words in chapter 7 and verse 4 of Romans. Paul said, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might be, in the King James Version, that you might be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Why? That we might bear fruit for God. A physical marriage bears children. A spiritual marriage bears fruit that is good. And there's a lot of different kinds of spiritual fruit. A lot of different kinds. There's, and it begins, obviously, with bringing souls into a friendship with Christ, helping others find him. There's lots of fruit. But we were born for oneness that we might produce fruit. We, are, we, just, we already read in 15.4 of John, if you abide in me, Jesus said, and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. I'm trying to be a time manager here. Okay, so I want to finish up quickly with what our Five, excuse me, well, seven. I, I'll, I'll get, we'll get to as many as we can. I'm watching that clock run stop just in a few minutes here. But here's the deal. Here are seven wonderful consequences of oneness with Christ as we will cultivate it. Number one, when we recognize, we've already talked about this, won't do a lot about this, when we recognize our oneness with Christ, we understand why we are a new creation. We've got a purpose and a mission. It's a blending of the human spirit with the divine to produce fruit. That Paul said, we know in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he said, if anyone is in Christ, he's what a new creation. The old is gone, the new has gone, the new has come. That old person with that tendency toward sin is dealt a death blow in our life, and he will try his best to resurrect himself. 
but it has been dealt a death blow. Number two, the second consequence. Our oneness with him means that there is no condemnation. Uwe quoted Romans 8.1 this morning. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. In fact, at the end of Romans in 33 and 34, Paul said, Who will bring any charge against those who's, whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. The word justifies means to declare righteous. God is declared righteous. It is God who justifies. Who then is him who condemns? And the answer is no one. No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, he's at the right hand of God, and he's praying for us. He's interceding for us. He's not going to condemn us. He's on our side. Yeah. Hebrews 7.25 says, I didn't, that's not the line there, Faye, but Hebrews, it comes to mind, though Hebrews 7.25 speaks of Jesus who ever lives to intercede for the saints. He's praying for us. Just like he prayed for Peter, that his faith would not fail. Jesus always gets answers to his prayers. Doesn't have that problem we have sometimes. And so he's praying for us. We're with him. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we're faithless, and sometimes we are, let's be brutally honest. There's times when we're practically faithless. Bible says if we're faithless he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself because of our oneness number three we have victory over sin Romans 8 2 says because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin of death there's two laws there's a superior law. There's a superior law, the law of the spirit of life that's stronger than the... It's the law of lift in, in aeronautics, and I'm, a, and I'm a long time pilot, but in aeronautics, the law of lift is so much stronger than the law of gravity. It really is. I, and, and, and in a lot of sermons, I take time at this moment to explain just why that is, but we won't do that. But you take, you take my word for it. <clears throat> want to move on here oh my goodness I tell you what I'm just gonna I'm gonna call a halt I'm just calling a halt to it right here and so uh, if any of you are interested I've got like I said I have the some scriptures over there at the side huh or we'd be here to 20 till Jason <laughs> I, I you are there is I have never been in a church where there's a pastor who respects the time of people any better than that man right there. <laughs> and so I, uh, I want to do that. I, I just want to do that too. Uh, okay, well, the point... There was a preacher once that had 12 points at the end. He was trying to sum up, and he said, uh, I can't remember these 12 points, but I believe in every one of them. And that was, that's, that's really kind of the deal. That, that's kind of the deal here. But number three, is, number three is the consequence we have victory over sin. We talked about that. Number four is our prayer life is empowered, and I so would love to talk about that. I would like to talk about why. It's because we have the mind of Christ. It says that we pray. And over in, 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 in 1 John 15, what does it say? It says we have confidence in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. And quite honestly, what we need to do, we need to spend some time being quiet before him and we need to ask him what is he doing what is he doing and what is he saying and just listen to what God deposits on our heart and mind we really need to because if we do then our prayers are powerful because we are one with him it's, it's just a 
a really important deal. There's there's other stuff here. Uh, number six is oh five miss five. Thank you. We begin to speak and act according to the Father's will, like Jesus, when we appreciate our oneness. That's one of the consequences. Number six, our oneness with him allows us to consciously live an ascended life with him. There's a verse of scripture. I don't, oh, in 3.13 of John. Jesus said, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man himself he's speaking of, who is in heaven. No one... Jesus is saying to his friends, I am in two places at the same time with you. I am here, but I am there. But you see, that's not just about Jesus because Paul wrote these wonderful words to us in the the second chapter of Ephesians, in chapter 4, excuse me, verse 4 to 6, he said, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive even when we were dead in transgressions. And it goes on to say, it is by grace you have been saved. And verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us together with him in the heavenly realms. And so what that means is is that we can pray, we can pray and live from heaven to earth. What that means in flesh out is we can spend time with Jesus hearing what the Father is saying because he's at our side in glory and he can transmit that through our spirit man into our mind and our soul and we can begin to hear and live an ascended life. We can truly be in two places at once. And the last point is we recognize When we recognize our oneness with Jesus, we begin to experience deep intimacy with him. Jason, you drove me to it. Let's all stand. I got How we doing? 1231, that's not horrible. Let's all pray. Holy Father, we thank you for allowing us the blessed privilege of becoming one with your son. We know that's something that you planned from eons before you said, let there be light. And so God, we ask that you would help us to appraise and evaluate this relationship we have, dear Lord. Help us, dear Father, to cultivate that by spending more time with you, by just plain being quiet before you and giving you a chance to reveal what it is that you're saying. We thank you beyond words that you've called us to such an amazing relationship of intimacy. And so God, help us to treat it as the treasure it is, for we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. So good. So good. Seven principles. I know he went over three minutes. No, I'm just kidding. That was good, man. Seven principles.